and a 10 pizzeria. I don't think it's a secret that the main reason people compare Freddy Fazbear's to Chuck E. Cheese is because it's it's the same shtick. I think it's pretty obvious. Obvious enough in fact that I don't really need to talk about it, but this is going out in like two weeks time so I needed numbers, okay? I'm literally filming this on the day that Security Breach is supposed to come out. So anything that relates it to Chuck E's if any, since this is one that takes place in a, a giant mall, and I don't think Chucky's has done that, it, it won't be on the list because the game doesn't release for like another seven hours. But I haven't heard of any other children's pizzerias with animatronics and all like the hoopla of cardboard pizza. I mean, like there there may be some overseas, but in the states where this game takes place and where the creator is from, I don't think that there's any competitors to Chucky e. Cheese. The idea of a pizzeria with robot animatronics that sing is pretty unique. So I. I I think that's fairly obvious. Also the name, Freddy, Fazbear, Chucky, Cheese, and at nine animatronics. Now not only are the animatronics just kind of the same, since you know they're all anthropomorphized animals, but even the characters seem the same. The inspiration for Chica could be one of many things, but most notably, in this case at least, one of Chucky's friends from the Chuck E. Cheese lineup is called Helen Henny, which would make a lot of sense given the alliteration in Chica's name and the fact that they're both chickens. Helen Henny and Chica the Chicken I think are pretty obviously meant to be connected, and while Bonnie and Freddy may not have direct comparisons, I think that like the whole like it's a pizzeria thing, the animatronics are pretty solid evidence as, as to why they're the same as well. Plus, Foxy may be in some ways based on the character of Rolf the Wolf from the Rock of Fire Explosion, Chauve's Pizza Places Animatronic Band, which is also a part of, of Chucky's group, as they both have their own stage apart from the other characters, and both animatronics are animals part of the Canidae family, or Canidae family. I'm not sure how it's pronounced, but that, that's just like foxes, wolves, dogs, etc. And it ain't arcade. And while plenty of places have arcades, I mean like hell, even like cousin has an arcade, but that's because he's absolutely rolling in it. The main comparison is the whole prize counter thing. Not many places have a prize counter, but it is certainly not exclusive to Chucky's. A uh, bowling alley in my hometown has one, uh, Dave and Buster's has one, the list goes on. I mean, if they really want to generate like a customer base based on the arcade, they usually have a prize counter. But I think that it's the arcade and prize counter in combination with everything else that kind of solidifies it as being a Chuck E. Cheese. Only Chuckies has all three of these pre Previous points, and even for me, I haven't gone to a Chucky's in God knows how long, but I can still picture the arcade clear as day. And all I need to do to change that memory into a memory of being at a Freddy Fazbear's is just change the animatronics. I can change them simply enough since it's not really a memory and really a recreation of a memory, like how the Rick uploads the virus in the season three premiere of Rick and Morty, since he makes a totally fabricated origin story, which we have since learned at least has a little bit of truth to it. So basically it's like that, okay? Take parts of something that I remember and change small things about it and then boom, I'm in Freddy Fazbear's. Change Chucky to Freddy and the, the guy in the costume dancing with the kids is is a Bonnie now, and now he's leading kids to the back room where the other animatronics are. Oh no. And the seven headlines. The Twitter account of Diamond Zia on June 27, 2020, tweeted out three photos with the line of, quote, FNAF will be real in 48 hours. These pictures were of news articles, one from USA Today titled, Five Children Have Gone Missing Inside Chuck E. Cheese, Parents Report Smells Coming, dot, dot, dot. One from Associated Press called, a Post Hour Worker at Chuck E. Cheese Reported Dead at 27. And a final one from the Something News titled, Night Shift Workers at Chuck E. Cheese claim strange movements from animatronics during post hours. However, this title had animatronics spelt incorrectly. It said, uh, animatronics. Everyone was freaking out, understandably, and the pictures of the articles, particularly the first one, were shared all across the internet. People were losing their minds, especially because this is around the time where Chuck E. Cheese was announcing their closure. However, people didn't realize that that these were just fake. Well, how are they fake, you ask? It's simple, source code editing. You can change what anything says on a website using like source code inspection, but it will only change for you. Like until you like reload the page, like by editing the source code. You just need to like find the aspect you're looking for and then once you do you can change it to whatever you want. So whoever made the original image had found an article about Chuck E. Cheese closing from USA Today and then changed the title to Five Children Going Missing and the same thing with the other articles. Hence why there are only images of the articles and not actual links. It was a hoax that blew up and honestly probably hurt Chuck E. Cheese even 
even more. And at six, closing. Also the fact that due to COVID, cause you know, global pandemic, a load of Chuck E. Cheese locations were closing, isn't helping the comparison to FNAF. Considering how multiple Chuck E. Cheese locations closed as well, not just the one. Like I said, some people were blaming these closings on missing children and other things, like in the last point, but that's not really the case. They were just starting to lose too much money to keep their restaurants operational, so they just had to close some of them. Did they close a location in Hurricane Utah, where the games take place? No. But they closed one in Layton, Utah, which is like a four hour drive from Hurricane. <laughs> Hurricane is actually closer to Las Vegas than it is to, to Layton. So I think we're safe to say that these pizzerias are safe from killing sprees, hopefully. And even rebranding part of their kitchen to Pascali's Pizza and Wings didn't really do them much good. But it helped Matt Patton get a hold of a pizza to test it to see if the Chuck E. Cheese pizzas were reassembled or if they were just born that way in a food theory. Um, and turns out they're just born that way. Halfway through into number five, Real Pizzeria. Before the release of FNAF 4, Scott Cawthon's website was littered with references to the numbers eight and seven in the source code. This caused many fans and even dear old Matt Pat to think that these were references to the year 1987, when the famous frontal lobe bite occurred. However, other fans believed that these were coordinates. So after plugging them into Google Maps somehow, which honestly I don't understand how you would have gone about doing that, like, do you just like type all the numbers in? Like, I, I don't know, I tried it and it didn't work. Whatever. After putting them into Google Maps somehow, they found a location that it actually gave. And the location was an actual pizzeria. Obviously, once this got shared, fans of the franchise started harassing the place trying to get answers. And while it was all one big coincidence, someone might have caught on before. Kathy Blockus reviewed the pizzeria saying that the robots kill. And I saw a robot fox killing a kid before in there. Run for your lives out of there. This was left three weeks before FNAF 4 was announced, which is when all the 8s and 7s appeared on the website. So while this is incriminating, they also left the place five stars on that review where they said that they were watching people get murdered. So obviously they're just a fan of the franchise. And at 4, FNAF 4 Bite. FNAF 4 may be one of the most confusing games in the franchise with seemingly nobody having solved it to this day unless Scott just hasn't mentioned it. But the Bite of 83, which takes place at the end of this game, makes these scarily like a real FNAF location. Not because something like this has happened before, or at least as far as I can tell from my research, but because this isn't a death that has to do with possessed animatronics or crazy technology or resurrected purple people being bruised from the inside thanks to an amalgam of animatronic parts. No, this just has to do with an animatronic being given way too much juice. Matt Pat tackled this exact topic in a theory back from 2017, where he determined that to cause a catastrophic brain failure like we see Crying Child suffer in that bite, each of the eight teeth that he gets bit with would have had to been applying over 14,000. Newtons of force. 14,758 Newtons of force to be exact. Which, like I've been saying, is serious overkill for moving an animatronic head. That would require multiple industrial grade pneumatic actuators that you wouldn't be able to fit in the suit, okay? This isn't a spring lock failure, like a lot of people say. This was something that is tangible in this reality. And that's probably even more terrifying than all of the jump scares at once. Getting close to the end in number three, disturbing desires. Okay, so this is something that while not directly translating into like the FNAF world or from FNAF to our world, it's a serious issue that I've seen in the comments, okay? So we've made a series of videos about how we could turn a closed Chuck E. Cheese location into a FNAF joint or even all of them into FNAF joints, but you see, in the comments of those videos, which you should totally go watch by the way, links in the icon, and then share the videos with Scott because that sounds like a fun project even if it's just like for a week, please. I, if Mr. Beast can open a fast food chain, Scott, I'm sure you can make FNAF real. The comments of those videos, okay, are full of various people telling me that they think it would be a great idea to have a real FNAF because then they could go and, and, and die in the, in the restaurant and possess an animatronic. Um. What? Why the absolute hell would you want that? First of all, okay, possession isn't real. That's not a thing in real life. I have yet to see any real evidence 
about it or anything paranormal, okay? But in addition to that, even going by FNAF rules, you would need to suffer heavily when you die in order to generate the agony that is needed to possess something. Since in FNAF, all possession is actually just a manifestation of your extreme agony grabbing onto something that's nearby, as we learned from Fazbear Frights and Dr. Phineas Taggart. If you're happy that you're in the FNAF restaurant and you're happy that you're dying there so you can possess something, you wouldn't end up possessing something because you wouldn't be in agony. You'd be happy. So, this is just a bad idea overall. Don't do it. And ultimately, in the number two employee manual. <laughs> oh, well, do you think that I'm talking about the FNAF employee manual? <laughs> Absolutely not. I wish it was. Uh, th this number is actually much more concerning than that. Because a particular image sent people into a frenzy with the idea that Chuck E. Cheese restaurant animatronics are actually gonna hurt you. A post from Twitter user at Pablo Thinghouse made mention of the restaurant's instruction manual, which is for employees, which included a section that said Chuck E. Cheese himself had facial recognition software that would cause him to come to life and attack any intruders caught on the property after hours. Sound familiar, anyone? <laughs> With the actual manual in the now hidden or deleted tweet saying, quote, it is always important that all Chuck E. Cheese night shift employees must wear a spare Chuck E. Cheese costume head to avoid any animatronic facial recognition, because if they spot any humans in the building post hours, they will automatically detect that person as a criminal trying to tamper with objects on the building, and that won't lead to anything good. And Pablo's reaction was probably realistic here, since they said, quote, uh, excuse me? And the fact that this is supposed to be the actual manual makes me sad. However, I looked it up, and it's not the case, but th this is still kind of freaky. And finally, in a number one, Nathan Dunlap. In December of 1993, after Chuck E. Cheese had closed in Aurora, Colorado, Margaret Kohlberg, the manager, was tallying receipts in the back room. While she does that, though, Bobby Stevens scrubs down the kitchen, and Sylvia Crawwell, Ben Grant, and Colleen O'Connor all work in cleaning the main area. However, there is someone hiding in the bathrooms, 19-year-old Nathan Dunlap. Earlier that year, he had been working there as a crook, before getting into an argument over his hours, which resulted in him losing his job. He was looking for revenge. He exited the washroom and began firing, killing everyone in the building. First Sylvia, then Ben, then Colleen. Then he went into the kitchen, where the bullet entered Bobby's jaw and sent him flying across the room. And then Nathan went to the back, where Margaret opened up the safe before being shot twice. Nathan then filled her bag with $1,500 cash and arcade tokens and keychains. Thanks to the security cameras, he was promptly arrested and sentenced to death. But Bobby did end up surviving, luckily, and he was actually able to testify at Nathan's trial. I got this theory from Matt Pat in his first ever game theory on FNAF, because he was relating it to the events of the actual series. But um, the fact that this lines up so well is, is pretty terrifying. And while it may not be true that it's based off of that, um, I think those stories are a, a little too close to just not think about it. This idea came to me thanks to the Freddy and Friends on tour episode 4 glitches that ended up revealing glitch trap when you assembled them like a puzzle. Which I found out on my own despite people in the comments claiming someone on Reddit already did it. I couldn't find the post when I saw these comments, okay? So, in my mind, I did it first. Anyways, this made me think about just what abilities Glitch Trap could have now that he's sentient code that uh, can apparently possess people who put on a VR headset. And honestly, I think with that ability to possess people as code, not even as a spirit, just as code, makes him literally able to do anything. But if we want to keep at least some element of realism, we can say that he can possess people, but he would have to return to the game. He couldn't go directly from a person to something else, which would kind of make sense. Now, how could Glitch Trap operate post FNAF VR and prior to the release of Security Breach, since this theory doesn't really involve that game? Well, let's work backwards. What could cause Glitch Trap to appear in Freddy and Friends on Tour? Well, that show is clearly a riff on the Fred Bear and Friends on Tour show that we saw hinted at in FNAF 4 on the TV. The same easter egg that gave us the date of the game of 1983. And if we think about this and how it coincides with the many worlds interpretation, every possibility does exist. The earth where the show is called Freddy and Friends also exists. This could be a way of signifying that this 
is in fact another Earth, since both shows seem to have a similar theme, with Fred Bear in the original case interacting with Foxy, and then clips of the various characters singing and performing, which follows the plot structure of the Freddy and Friends episodes with characters running away from Foxy and then ultimately performing, eventually performing with him in the final episode. It's also worth mentioning that while we expected six episodes revealing all six numbers of the release date with the final two being Roxy and Monty, we didn't get those. We got four episodes stopping when the last animatronic from the original gang was in the thumbnail, meaning that there may not be anyone else, at least at the time. It's also worth noting that the website showcasing the latest episode, SecurityBreachTV.com, also has hidden messages around the desk if you hover your mouse in certain areas, with the majority of the screen being be careful, hovering over the phone saying I thought I heard something, the Steel Wool Studios logo saying we know all, and the button to play the latest episode just having question marks. These are things that remind me of how psychic friend Fred Bear would speak to us in the minigames for FNAF 4, only further solidifying the FNAF 4 connection. And you know, since I said it, I have to do it. He's here, he's there, he's everywhere. Who are you gonna call? Psychic friend Fred Bear. So if this is FNAF 4's Fred Bear and Friends cartoon, what would that mean? Well, my idea is like that of an old theory of mine, that the FNAF multiverse is beginning to expand as the release of Security Breach and ultimately the Fazbear Fan vs. Initiative games draw closer. The Fazbear Fan vs. Initiative, if you don't know or remember, being a collection of fan games that Scott funded so that they could get new installments or versions, along with helping the creators with merchandising and porting the new games into consoles and getting them on on store shelves, which is incredibly generous. He was also staying out of the development process so that they could make the games they wanted. The games included our Five Nights at Candy's 4, The Joy of Creation Ignited Collection, Pop Goes Evergreen, One Night at Flumpty's 3, and Five Nights at Freddy's Plus, which is a reimagining of the original FNAF game. Which is where I'm guessing this universe's timeline starts or builds off of, considering how Five Nights at Candy's relies on the FNAF story for its own story. The most notable one for me personally out of all of these games is the joy of creation and those of you familiar with the game may already know why. In the joy of creation you play as Scott Cawthon and his family as they try and survive real life FNAF animatronics known as the ignited animatronics. These are drawn to the house thanks to another character coming from the games, Michael. And since that game takes place in our world, in the real world, I think the groundwork is being laid for that story now. This game specifically needs to be remade since the assets that were used in the original were copywritten and found in the Steam library, etc. So they have to remake all the assets already. So remaking the story so Scott doesn't quit after FNAF 2 and instead retires before Security Breach is entirely in the cards. This game is also the outlier, the one that takes place in a world where FNAF is a game and not real, unlike Five Nights at Candy's. So making the world that game takes place in be this world would also be astounding for marketing. Scott retiring may not have actually been because he's tired of making games that aren't for his kids, or because of the whole donating to anti-LGBTQ plus politicians. It could have been pre-planned, and Scott used his cancellation as a way to get more eyes on his retirement. Since the story revolves around Scott retiring, and he now has, it's entirely possible that this game gets updated to involve this drama, especially because the animatronics and Michael will need a way to get out of the games. But how could they do that? It's extremely unrealistic, right? Like, how could game code suddenly break out of their game into our world and become sentient? You see where I'm going with this? Glitch trap. He is the reason. He's the key to how this story could realistically, albeit somewhat unrealistically, work. Glitch Trap being sentient code from the main FNAF universe could use his control over the games and code to basically pull these characters out and put them into real endoskeletons or micro trips and send them after Scott. And he could be testing these abilities. Hence why Freddy and Friends is different to Fredbear and Friends, because he can't pull things over perfectly, which in turn would help explain the ignited forms of the animatronics. It also explains all the glitches in the episodes, with the other world, the actual FNAF world, breaking through. Hence why the scenes we see glitch through are actually taken directly from the trailers. And the only glitch that wasn't in the trailer? 
the glitch trap puzzle. But how could he have gotten here? How could glitch trap have gotten from his universe onto our YouTube? It's simple. Us. YouTubers like me who have played through the oh so famous FNAF VR. Since what happens at the end of the game when you collect all 16 tapes? You get assimilated by Glitch Trap and merge with him no matter what you do. And then where do you end up uploading the footage of you getting merged to? YouTube. Where did Glitch Trap pull the episodes of Fredbear and Friends to that caused them to get slightly modified because this isn't 1983? YouTube. We as the player of FNAF VR and then the YouTubers uploading the gameplay managed to get Glitch Trap onto our YouTube. And as such, he is now able to be the link between the universe's letting Joy of Creation Ignited collection to be updated and based on our real world. I personally don't think that Scott was really retiring. I believe that at least it started out as that plan, but maybe now he enjoys the life so he may just stick to it. Who knows? Well, only Scott. And uh, Scott Cawthon isn't known for talking clearly. It's a pirate ride. Given that this is already in the style of a game in FNAF VR, certainly does help importing this to an arcade cabinet, but there would be some things that they'd have to change, like turning it into one of those like classic shooter arcade games where the screen scrolls as you fight off bad guys threatening innocent civilians, and it tells you what to shoot and what not to shoot. Yeah, it, like that's the kind of arcade game I see this as, except instead of scrolling sideways, it moves forward like the cart does in the ride in FNAF VR. It could just be a simple aim and shoot kind of thing, but maybe they could add some animatronics sneaking in and throwing some cake or pizza at you that you'd have to shoot to block. This would be in order to end the game early so that you'd then have to pay more tokens or just straight up money depending on how the system was run but based on modern practices I think it would be a token system because it probably would end up making them more money in the long run. And nine fun with plush trap. Fun with Plush Trap is a simple game that would operate much like it did in FNAF 4 for the arcade cabinet. Despite having more of a presence in FNAF VR, the simplicity of the controls in FNAF 4 would be exactly how this game operates, just in an arcade cabinet, which would require you to just push a button to get the light to shine, and then you let go of it to turn it off and allow Plush Trap to move. Giving you the 60 second countdown to a jump scare if you fail to stop him before the timer, or if he gets to you before you stop him. It's a simple game with a simple premise, but it would work incredibly well for an arcade machine and I think plenty of people would play it. And maybe you could have like multiple levels like Donkey Kong style with various smaller nightmare animatronics like Fun with Nightmare Balloon Boy, Fetch, Mini Renas, etc. Assuming that Plush Trap isn't a form of Fetch already. And today Plush Babies. The two Plush Baby mini games where you have to look around for the various somehow animated baby plushes before they get to you is an interesting concept that with some tweaking could work for an arcade cabinet. It would require a joystick as the spotlight following the joystick and you just move it around to move the spotlight but it's something that I think would work kind of well but it would have to be done right I don't know exactly what done right would look like I'm an ideas guy okay I'm not a programmer but I'm sure that it wouldn't be that difficult to work out I hope it wouldn't be as detailed or scary as the main minigame in FNAF VR but it would still be something that would work decently well it may not be the most popular game at the arcade but that's why you have multiple levels including the hard mode one and the DLC one in the pumpkin patch plus that's why it's only number eight because it would just it it would be harder to get done properly. And it's seven happiest day. The Happiest Day minigame is some of the most important lore and moments in the series, with the original Missing Children from the first Missing Children's incident from 1985 getting their souls released, showing that there are multiple ways to deal with what would later be called Remnant, the infusion of metal and soul, or rather, metal and extreme emotion, <laughs> or maybe in Springtrap's case, metal. Get it? Because his human meat is also in the suit. <laughs> Never mind. Either way, the Happiest Day minigame is not a simple one-shot minigame. There's some build-up to it. It's like the main story of FNAF 3, so seeing those various minigames and glitches come together into a single arcade cabinet would be a beautiful sight. Almost as beautiful as Glamrock Chica. I mean, as my idea for a real FNAF pizzeria, which you should go totally watch, by the way. It's in one of the corners. I don't know which one anymore. And it's six, Claw Machine. This is pretty dark, but you people seem to love that kind of thing. So, what about a claw machine that was designed to be baby while she was grabbing Elizabeth? Is that too far? Like, a claw machine that's built to look like the baby animatronic on the outside with a window on the stomach where the claw would come out. 
and that's where the claw machine is. I think that would not only be a fun way to make it a FNAF themed claw machine, but it would also be dark as hell, and I love that kind of thing. Plus, it's about a fictional death, so it's not really distasteful. The idea also stands that this is something out of the box for this list, and I wanted to see what you thought about it, rather than just ranting on about the various mini games in the series for 10 minutes. However, it's time to get back to that, so moving on! How I threw in a number 5? Corn Maze. Corn Maze is one of the most stressful games in all of FNAF VR, compared only to the likes of the hallway from that very same DLC. Corn Maze revolves around you walking through a maze made of walls, not corn for some reason, in search of colored keys. These keys unlock their respectively colored gate and result in you winning. However, Grim Foxy is chasing you and he always knows where you are. The only way to really get him off your tail, pun intended, is to hide behind cardboard cutouts after he notices you. The maze is also filled with clusters of crows that will alert Foxy to your location if stepped on, which will result in him finding you faster, as well as scaring the living hell out of you. This game, in the same vein as the Help Wanted flat mode version, but with, controlled with a joy stick and buttons would work incredibly well, and you wouldn't have to find all four keys to unlock a secret one. You just don't have a secret one, and you're golden. Man, I'm a genius. And at four, Security Puppet. Ah yes, Security Puppet. One of the three mini games required to play through to completion for the Lore Keeper ending of FNAF 6. And let's be honest, you should always play mini games through to completion, otherwise it's just mean. The Security Puppet mini game was pretty simple. Keep the assigned child away from the exit. However, the only catch is that there was no assigned child until the third time booting up the game, where the child will already be outside, thus you failing. We know that this child is Charlie, who goes on to possess the puppet, and this was the only time we've seen a kill from two different angles. However, a game kind of like a Where's Waldo kind of thing with security bracelets seems like a wonderful and simple idea, especially when we know what the character is really trying to prevent. Would there be a green bracelet character, or would we only be looking for the green band? I don't know, it would be up to Scott, also Scott, or I guess whoever takes over next, please do do this. Getting close to the end in a number three, Deliver Pizzas. The mini game that opens FNAF 6 isn't like anything else we've seen. Okay, well, it's it's kind of like Take Cake, but this time you're throwing pizzas at kids' screaming faces, and honestly, I love that idea. The fantasy of throwing a pizza in the screaming kid's face has been present ever since those little buggers in my old building bounced their basketball off my door and made my dog go absolutely nuts. But even without my secret thoughts, this would still be a fun arcade game, and I'm not letting you fight me on this. The difficulty of the game was already defined even before the real FNAF 6 started, and it was cool. But then throw in added difficulty of it being a full game and you have a whole new experience. At least, I think it would be at least, so can't be sure unless we try. And ultimately, in a number two, Midnight Motorist. Midnight Motorist is another one of those games that you could test in FNAF 6 that just feels right. The game is pretty simple, but it's certainly exactly what we need in an arcade cabinet at a pizzeria. A game for the short attention span of a child. You simply drive around until you run into three things, then boom, it's game over. You get tickets based on how far you went, or it's one of those lame ones where you don't get tickets at all because there's no feasible way to calculate that, which would also be kind of understandable. Or you just get three. You know the ones I'm talking about. Uh, Midnight Motorist would make a good arcade game aside from the whole yellow guy mustard man debacle. So cut that part out and you're in the money, baby. Go forth and collect the king's tax of tickets and tokens. And finally, in a number one, Fruity Maze. Fruity Maze, I think, was the obvious first choice here because while yes, the game does progressively get darker, it doesn't have to. <laughs> you can stick to the original, like, level one Fruity Maze motif. Add a proper goal or objective and then have a weird FNAF version of a Pac-Man style game. Boom. You're done. Just don't make it depressing and allow the player to continue as long as they can, just like a normal Pac-Man game would work and you're good. And you're golden. <laughs> golden Bonnie, dare I say. <laughs> and maybe throw in a certain level where it's like the messed up dog, flowers, and blood kind of thing just to make sure it's authentic, because knowing these comments, you'll all be disappointed and even get mad if these things don't turn into something dark and twisted. I don't know about something like new being added to the series in the real world, but like, I, I don't know if you'd want that to be twisted and disturbing, like if it was a new arcade game, for example, but something like Fruity Maze, you'd insist on it. So yeah, I know you're all sick and I love you for it. And 10, Brian Wells. This is certainly an interesting case that you may not really think relates to William, but let me explain my thought process. Brian Douglas Wells was an American pizza delivery driver who was killed during a complex bank robbery plot. The plot involved a collar bomb, a scavenger hunt, the robbery itself, and a 
pizza delivery man. Following an attempt to rob PNC Bank, Wells was surrounded by police. That's when the bomb around his neck ended up detonating, killing him. And while his family denies that he was a part of it, investigators and a federal prosecutor concluded that Wells was a knowing participant in the bank robbery. However, he was told that the bomb was fake and he did not know that his co-conspirators intended for him to die. Now, I think that it was probably detonated because he got caught and they didn't want him to rat on them and that is the prevailing theory amongst these people as well, against amongst the prosecutor and whatnot. But aside from being a pizza delivery man for Mamma Mia's Pizzeria, what possible connection could he have to Afton? Well, being killed by a device that was supposed to be safe, for one, the spring locking and the collar, being betrayed by your peers, in William's case most likely Henry, and the affinity for complex plans. I feel like this may have been at least a slight source of inspiration, especially since this came up when I searched for pizza place serial killers, um, because I was hoping that there would be one. Um, uh, that's weird to say. Um, <laughs> let's just... Let's just move on. And at nine, Andrew Cunanan. Andrew Cunanan was born in San Diego, California and eventually settled in San Francisco's Castro District and socialized with older wealthy gay men while indulging heavily in illicit substances. It's unclear what set him off, but he began a cross-country killing spree of five unknown victims, the last of which was actually fashion designer Gianni Versace. Cunanan killed himself on a Miami boathouse in 1997, and if that didn't set off an alarm, uh, congratulations, you have not been ruined by FNAF yet. However, William Afton also had five victims at least, but definitely only had five when FNAF 1 and even around FNAF 2 was released. And while FNAF 1 does take place in 1993, many have theorized it to instead take place in 1997, which is unlikely given the minimum wage of the times and the connection to another real person, but nonetheless, it's certainly an interesting case of more possible dates lining up and the same number of victims. You know, a lot of people on this list are actually going to have five victims, and it's it's extremely creepy. And at eight, Nathan Dunlap. In December of 1993, after Chuck E. Cheese had closed in Aurora, Colorado, Margaret Kohlberg, who was the manager of this Chuck E. Cheese, was tallying receipts in the back room. While she was doing that, Bobby Stevens was scrubbing down the kitchen, and Ben Grant, Colleen O'Connor, and Sylvia Crawwell were all working in the main party area. However, there was someone hiding in the bathroom, 19-year-old Nathan Dunlap, who earlier that year had begun working as a cook, but was fired after an argument over his hours. But this time, he was looking for revenge. He exited the bathroom and began firing, killing everyone in the building. First Sylvia, then Ben, then Colleen. Then he went into the kitchen where he shot Bobby, although Bobby ended up surviving and was actually a key witness in his case. Then Nathan went to the back room where Margaret opened the safe before being shot twice. Nathan filled her bag with $1,500 cash, arcade tokens, and keychains, but thanks to the security cameras, he was promptly arrested and sentenced to death. Thanks to MatPat and his first game theory on FNAF, this one is fairly well known, hence why it's closer to the top, but if I didn't include it, I feel like everyone in the comments would have asked me why, so there you go. And it's seven Burke and Hare. The Burke and Hare murders were 16 serial killings committed over a period of about 10 months in 1828 in Edinburgh, Scotland. The two men who committed these killings, last names Burke and Hare, were doing it because they also sold the corpses to Robert Knox for dissection at his anatomy lectures. There's actually a shortage of corpses in Edinburgh, and thus people actually started grave robbing and selling the corpses rather than selling the possessions. Since a loophole in the system only considered it a theft if the body was taken with its clothes. Naked corpses were fine to take though, apparently. They didn't really think that one through. These two were killing in the name of science, something that we suspect William was doing as well. However, they actually were in a messed up way contributing to the furthering of science, whereas William is only doing it for his own selfish reasons and to become immortal. After Hare was given immunity to confess to the murders so that they could convict Burke, Burke was sentenced to death. Shortly afterwards, his corpse was dissected and his skeleton was displayed at the Anatomical Museum of Edinburgh Medical School, where, as of 2021, it actually still remains. Oh, and by the way, the reason they're known as Burke and Hare was because both of their first names are William. Yeah. So maybe Afton's wife is named something similar. And at six, Ted Bundy. During an interview with Daco, PJ Haywood, the voice actor for William Afton in Sister Location, FNAF AR, and Ultimate Custom Night, said that Scott Cawthon described William as being a charismatic, smooth-talking snake oil salesman, which coincides with book William being able to convince anyone of anything. This is actually very similar to how Ted Bundy had been described. Bundy was regarded as charismatic and handsome, traits that he exploited to win the trust of both his victims and society as a whole. He would typically approach 
approaches victims in public places, either feigning a physical impairment such as an injury or impersonating an authority figure before bludgeoning them until they were unconscious. While he did operate nearly a decade before Afton started his spree, those are merely just like year numbers. But one of the most interesting facts, however, is that in 1975, Bundy was arrested and jailed in Utah for aggravated kidnapping and attempted criminal assault. In Utah, where the games and the crimes of Afton take place. Halfway through in number five, Arthur Gary Bishop. Arthur Gary Bishop was an American serial killer in 1983, and as a result of a routine police investigation, he confessed to the murders of five young boys between 1979 and 1983. Bishop was born in Hinckley, Utah, and was the eldest of six brothers. Bishop was raised as a devout Latter day Saint, Mormon, and was an Eagle Scout and an honor student, which is already suspicious in comparison to Afton, given that Afton was also regarded as intelligent given his talent for animatronics, especially in the 80s and his passion for business. But not only that, Bishop also operated under an alias. Bishop was arrested for embezzlement in February of 1978 and given a five year suspended sentence, but he skipped his parole and fled to Salt Lake City, living under the alias of Roger Downs. Under this alias, Bishop would then kill five boys between 1979 and 1983. It's also interesting that multiple key dates in Bishop's life line up closely to releases of FNAF games. On July 14th, 1993, he was arrested and FNAF 4 came out on July 23rd, nine days after that. Well, not in the same year, but you know what I mean. Bishop's first kill was on October 14th, 1979, and Sister Location was released on October 7th. I mean, it's not concrete, but it's certainly interesting. Plus, also, he was caught in 1983, the same year that Crying Child was bit. In at 4, Donald Harvey. Harvey belonged to a group of psychos known as the Angels of Mercy who claimed to kill for the benefit of the victim. Harvey was convicted of 37 of his more than 57 suspected murders, and he confessed to as many as 87. When Harvey was hired at the Cincinnati VA Medical Hospital, he managed to collect over 30 pounds of cyanide which he had kept in his home. He also kept diaries and detailed notes on each one of his victims, including how he killed them. That gives me just that, that's intense William Afton vibes. Like, not not for some certain reasons, but the delusion of him thinking that he was doing it for the benefit of the victims or just for any benefit uh, is still, is, it's horrifying, okay? It's the exact same kind of delusion that I could see William having. And a similar delusion to what he seems to have in the games. In the books, he's not exactly like this from my memory, but the game version certainly seems to be the type, okay? Especially given his appearance in the Foxy Go 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 minigame where he's smiling. Getting close to the end in number three, Thomas Lee Dillon. Thomas Lee Dillon was a serial sniper found guilty of killing five men, again, with the five. Directed by voices in his head, Dillon killed people randomly. According to attending psychiatrists, Dillon's delusions of grandeur spilled over into the reality of his life and the lives of his victims. His victims were killed by a high-powered rifle while they participated in outdoor activities, sometimes hundreds of miles from Dillon's home. Authorities did not link the killings to Dillon until he actually sent a letter to a local paper. After the FBI I put together a criminal profile of the killer, a friend of Dylan's actually brought into the attention of the authorities, which in my mind is very close to the story of William Afton. The amount of victims, the authorities only investigating those murders after they got tipped off by a friend of the killer, in Afton's case that being Henry, the delusions or the voices in his head could be him being possessed. But honestly, a whole load of these people are just so much like William, it's terrifying. And ultimately, in at number two, John Wayne Gacy. John Wayne Gacy, as I'm sure you know, was an American serial killer who killed 33 young men and boys. Gacy regularly performed at children's hospitals and charitable events as Pogo or Patches the Clown, personas that he had devised. He became known as the killer clown due to his public services as a clown prior to the discovery of these crimes, but jeez. Gacy committed all of the crimes inside of his ranch house, which is a horrible idea, just like William killing inside of his own pizza. Pizzeria. Typically, he would lure a victim to his home and then dupe them into donning handcuffs on the pretext of demonstrating a magic trick. And while this is absolutely disgusting and really makes me sick to my stomach, there are still a few similarities to Afton. Okay, killing in a place related to you. For Gacy, it was his ranch house, and for Afton, it's his business. The target demographic is also the same with young people, although Afton also killed girls, um, which I don't, I don't even want. Ugh. And while you may think that this is a stretch, uh, even FNAF itself made the connection with FNAF AR through the clown spring trap skin. Um, intentional or not, that, come on, that's, that's a, that's a connection. 
And finally, in at number one, Robert Berdella. Robert Berdella is, to me, the seemingly perfect inspiration for William Afton. Not only did this man own his own business called Bob's Bizarre Bazaar, where he reportedly sold human skulls, but he also seemingly started his killing spree in 1984. The MO is certainly not the same. Uh, Berdella would drug and kidnap men that he met in bars and on the streets, but the same idea of killing people you meet in a restaurant scene is carried over to William. There is no confirmed inspiration for William, hence this list, but there are certainly a decent amount of similarities between these two. In fact, if you combine like all the serial killers we talked about on this list, especially these last four, you'll basically get a real William Afton, and I don't like that, okay? That's horrifying. But again, that was the point of this list, so it was a way for me to talk about FNAF without having to talk about FNAF, okay? I didn't go into too much detail with these because, well, I I'm sure you can guess why, um, but yeah. Either way, I think that this is a, a pretty... The, the, the similarities are scary. That's all I have to say. Well, first of all, let's get this out of the way instantly. If FNAF was real, it would be horrible. Just straight up. Five kids would have gone missing in one of their locations, and the company probably would have closed down. But let's assume that people would still end up going, whether it's because they didn't believe the lies, or thought that the government made it up, or because it's their choice, or because they're a YouTuber who wants views. Why are you looking at me like that? Well, assuming that people still went to the restaurant because perhaps maybe they vanished around the area instead of inside the place, what would it be like to live in a real Five Nights at Freddy's? For a kid, it would be pretty awful, but you also wouldn't know it. The world would be dangerous and anyone could be William Afton's next victim, but you wouldn't know that there was a serial killer on the loose with murderous animatronics able to disguise themselves and hide in plain sight that are willing to kill at any moment. But I mean, like, to be fair, that's also like real life, minus the animatronics. For adults, if you have kids, you may be worried. I mean, any parent is always worried about their kids, but if there was a group of kids who went missing in your area, I'm sure that there would at least be a small amount of paranoia. And honestly, it would be reasonable. I mean, I grew up in a house where my father was always worried. So much so that my sister couldn't walk up to her friend's house up the street without him watching to make sure she was okay. And while that would probably be extreme for most parents, if there was a very real threat of kidnapping, I'm sure that there would be a lot of curfews. For the sake of this entire thing, we also have to assume that the police didn't investigate the interiors of the animatronics themselves, despite them smelling like death and leaking body fluids, including blood. Since that's something literally anyone with common sense would check when investigating the disappearance of children and then learning that animatronics are leaking blood and smelling like a dead body. But what of the technology that we see in these games? Would animatronics that can alter their appearance be realistic? No. Of course not. The springwalk suits, the illusion discs, the twisted animatronics, and the like are all extremely improbable considering the actual technology of not only our time, but the 80s when this would have normally taken place. At least, if we have a rough idea of the timeline, which honestly at this point, we could be totally wrong about the timeline. The technology in the games is so highly advanced that we have absolutely no idea what else they could have access to. They could have smartphones in the 80s for crying out loud. And if they don't, then William should have capitalized on that rather than murdering countless innocent kids because he could have literally been a billionaire. The highly advanced technology would have to be disregarded in terms of the abilities of William Afton. So while this seems like a fight that nobody could really win, realistically, it wouldn't be as bad as we think, at least in those terms, since even Chuck E. Cheese, the closest thing to Freddy Fazbear's in our world, obviously, still only has the most simple robotic abilities known to man, despite the popularity of Five Nights at Freddy's and their ability to capitalize on that trend by taking some of those concepts, like the advanced robotics, not the dead kids, and then converting them into real life, because like the concepts in the actual pizzeria, not not having kids go missing, like I said, that's that's a bad idea. Although based on comments left on previous videos, especially about how a real life Freddy's would happen, there have been plenty of people that are willing to die, or more likely to go to Chuck E. Cheese if it was more dangerous for some reason. Y'all are weird. But one final query. 
how would YouTubers handle it? Clearly, there are YouTubers in this world, thanks to the mention of Matt Pat, or at the very least to Game Theory in the Fast Bear Frights books, so what of the others? Well, we would most likely not be talking about FNAF. Something that I'm sure a lot of you would enjoy, but also something that you wouldn't be aware of, which is a whole other can of worms that I won't be getting into today, because you wouldn't know about FNAF, because FNAF wouldn't be a thing. However, I'm sure that there would be plenty of true crime and conspiracy YouTubers heading to A or the same Freddy Fazbear's where the kids went missing in order to solve the case. Or really just talk about it and get nowhere with it. Hmm. Sounds like someone I know. Since they don't have the clearance or the equipment to do an actual investigation or on a potentially closed case. Shane Dawson would 100% have gone there for that same conspiracy theory video, and the psychic twins would definitely have showed up at some point and definitely sensed something, but not quite known what it was. Ooh. Matt Pat may have made a food theory video about it, because he made a food theory video about Chuck E. Cheese, but the thing is, these YouTubers coming to investigate, would they be William's next targets? It's an interesting question, because as far as we know, he's only killed one adult, and that was Henry. Every other victim has been a kid, so while they may be in more danger, there would clearly be a bigger issue in trying to deal with these YouTubers, especially if they get killed or die mysteriously shortly after visiting a Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. It would probably start some form of curse rumor that would only get more people to go there to try to solve that case. But how would Freddy's have dealt with the pandemic? Would they have made enough to survive the years of quarantine? Or would they, like our Chuck E. Cheese, have to file for bankruptcy? Would they get to open their Pizzaplex? Or would some problematic tweets from William Afton rise and cause the restaurant to get cancelled for calling Chica a he? These are all good questions that we will never really have an answer for, because, well, FNAF isn't real. And that's why people keep commenting that nothing in these videos is scary. No sh It's not real. Can't actually hurt you. That's why it's not scary. Scary is subjective. Just relax. And it's in Springtrap. Craftix Gaming's YouTube channel features a video of a real Springtrap costume, and honestly, it's terrifying. Springtrap is the main animatronic of FNAF 3, and this costume is freaking nuts. This is a very good costume, and while Springtrap may not be the scariest animatronic, he's not someone I'm gonna want to tussle with. However, I wanna talk about what's going on with this character, because my guy, you dressed up as a possessed man who is inhabiting an animatronic, unable to die but still decaying. You are quite literally dressing up as a serial killer. Like in, in the FNAF world, if you dressed up like this, it would be like if you dressed up as Ted Bundy in this world. And if you want to be in FNAF that badly, okay, don't dress as the serial killer is all I'm saying. And I know that's ironic coming from me. Okay, given what I'm dressed like at this moment, do I look like I want to be in Five Nights at Freddy's? Have I made things seem like I want to be in this world? Because if I have, you need to watch more of these videos, okay? Also, I'm dressed up as the, the purple guy who makes no appearance in the actual FNAF world, okay? There is no actual, I mean, okay, there is the actual purple guy, but he doesn't look like this, okay? The purple guy that I am dressed as is not actually a, a real, version of the serial killer in their world, okay? I don't want to be in that world. Those doors aren't it, Chief. They ain't it. No. The doors ruin it for me. In the nine, Scrap Baby. Scrap Baby is a creepy animatronic. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Scrap Baby is by far creepier than the normal a baby animatronic, and this costume certainly does it justice. Animatronics are a difficult costume to really make, since we're people, and unfortunately do not have robotic limbs for the most part. Or if we do, we typically try to make it look like a real leg instead of a robot leg. But a Scrap Baby is even more difficult since, you know, it's a scrap animatronic, and it has a giant freaking claw in its hand. Scrap Baby is a very damaged and recycled version of Baby with a realistic reddish orange kind of bodysuit, light blue stuff, pig yellow pigtails and okay, she wears on she wears an orange top with red ferrules and it's just super damaged, okay? Like this she's very damaged. 
mentally and physically. Yet somehow Instagram user Gaius Bazzani was able to recreate this in an awesome way. So, very well done. And at 8, Vanny. With Vanny being an upcoming villain and already one of the most popular characters in the series, there are bound to be plenty of costumes of her. However, this one from Rojito Uwu on Twitter is probably the most accurate and creepiest one I've seen. Vanny being a reluctant follower does in a way technically make this a glitch trap cosplay as well, but we won't really talk about that because that's not what counts. This costume is probably the most realistic costume on this list because, well, Vanny in the games ended up making her own suit and is just a human inside, whereas like the other characters like Scrap Baby or Spring Chop are animatronics as well as sometimes part human, be it soul or another body. And Rogito's costume follows the exact same concept as Vanny, just a person who makes their own suit. Which makes this potentially one of the scariest things of all. I mean, technically it's not the same thing because they're not possessed and enticed to make it by the person possessing their brain, but, I mean, it's close enough. I mean, they could be possessed for all we know. I don't know. I don't know. And it's Evan Ennard. Costumes don't really have to be elaborate to be scary. Take for example this Ennard cosplay by YouTube channel Skywarped33. The entire endoskeleton spaghetti bits aren't there, but the lights and sounds make it even more frightening than you'd think. The face also opens up and I think that we all know how I feel about animatronics who can move their face at will at this point, okay? It's not something that should be allowed. However, even without all the parts and the eyes, this Ennard cosplay is not something I would want to run into in a dark alley, especially not after that goddamn vent repair mini game that caused me to have some serious issues. Okay, I, I, it, it's rough. Okay, I used to like spaghetti, man. Like now, what? Am, now, what am I supposed to do? And it's six, Nightmare Freddy. Nightmare Freddy is one of the most iconic versions of the character, even if there are only three games that feature this guy, those being FNAF 4, Ultimate Custom Knife, and FNAF ER. However, this Nightmare Freddy cosplay is insane, and in my opinion, it would have been our frontrunner for the Coupe de France cosplay competition that it was for back in 2017. The video was uploaded by YouTube channel Gorgon Geek, and this guy plays the robot thing really well. But as soon as he drops that microphone, he goes into terror mode, and it's certainly something to behold. I would have enjoyed it if he had like the little Fretels with him, but the moving mouth is certainly a nice touch, especially with the attempted jump scares they do in the video, because he just goes like ah and stuff. Like imagine if this guy had started twerking though. <laughs> At one point I thought he was going to. He went to pick up the mic and I thought he was just gonna start busting it, but no. I think that would have won them gold though. If you if you get this out of here. If you had started twerking my guy, you would have won. I don't know what place you came in, but if you had twerked, you would have won. Halfway through into number five, buff helpy. Okay. This may not be a cosplay, but Buff Helpy is probably the most disturbing non-cosplay character I can really include on this list. If you didn't already know, Buff Helpy is a meme that was created on a Daco FNAF meme review video and has ever since been haunting him and the rest of the community. Don't get me wrong, okay? I love Helpy. But this Buff Helpy meme has generated a whole load of Buff FNAF character ideas and it terrifies me now. There's no, nowhere is safe from these creations. If you look up any character, you're bound to find a buff version of them at some point. You just need to scroll down enough, okay? It's, it's just, it's one of the rules of the internet, okay? Same thing with what happens to Chica. But no matter what, this is just some psychological torment that I wish, I, I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy, actually. But I, I'm talking about it because, like, it's Halloween, and the world is currently my worst enemy, so if I have to look at this thing on a regular basis when I'm writing these goddamn lists, you have to look at it for this one number, okay? One number, that's all I ask. And at four, Nightmare. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Nightmare is the scariest animatronic from the games, hands down. This guy will get me every time, and it's one of those reasons I just refuse to play FNAF 4. The other is Nightmare Fredbear, but at least I don't have to deal with them in real life, right? They're only a nightmare character created in the mind of a coma patient in a video game, right? Well, guess again. Huh. Thanks to Zomb Bunny Creations on Amino Apps, we get both. Nightmare and Nightmare Fredbear. Ironically, Nightmare Fredbear is played by their twin sister. And I mean, it's ironic because, well, Elizabeth Afton is sometimes presumed to be Crying Child's twin sister. Anyway, these absolute hulking costumes are going to make me drop a load of my pants. Like, if I saw this in real life, holy crap. Like, uh, imagine actually living in a house that is at least kind of laid out like the one from FNAF 4. And then your, your kids want to play a prank on you. My grandparents' house is kind of laid out like this. It's not, it's not as simple as just two halls on either side of the room. But like, they have a room, the master bedroom, 
does have two doors. So theoretically, that's something that can be reenacted there. I don't want to do that. No. Getting close to the end, in number three, Glitch Trap. We know my issue with Glitch Trap, all right, okay? We know that I just want to watch William Apton burn and then leave him there permanently, hence why I'm wearing the costume. But I want him to, like, I want him to actually be in hell and then stay there while we move on with another killer or something else in the series. Please, for God's sake, Scott. I hate this always comes back thing that he's got going on. And despite being dressed as purple guy, I want William dead. So, when I saw this frighteningly realistic looking glitch trap costume, my nerves hit an all time high. I think the sheer simplicity of the glitch trap suit is certainly something that makes this a creepy costume since the stitches are very accentuated here. They're very clear on this version. Like, it might be like the higher contrast than like the actual suit in the games, because like you can you know that they're there, but you can't really tell. But like, either way, this is creepy. Plus, again, it's another version of William Goddamn Afton who already haunts my nightmares. So what the heck, Zombunny Creations? Again, on Twitter this time. Why do you got to do this to me, huh? Why, bro? And ultimately, in at number two, Twisted Freddy. Holy ever living hell, okay? This is a horrific masterpiece that I could only hope to achieve. This full body Twisted Freddy costume is probably one of the most horrific FNAF costumes I've ever seen. Especially because I believe that the Twisted animatronics are probably the scariest version of the animatronics present in the novels, and a solid time for the scariest animatronics alongside the nightmare ones from FNAF 4. This is some pretty damn expert craftsmanship if you ask me, though, okay? This is a full body suit, and it blows my freaking mind. Like, look at this. It would weigh a ton, and it would definitely need a hander, especially if my clumsy was the one walking around in it, but it straight up looks like if Freddy Krueger were an animatronic. And I mean, I'm not mad about it in the slightest, but like, it's still freaking creepy. So well done, Deregular Sauce, who is the Twitter user behind this glorious creation. Well done. And finally, in at number one, Withered Bonnie. This Withered Bonnie cosplay is probably the scariest damn FNAF cosplay I've ever seen. This is incredible and comes from the YouTube user The Nick of Time. At first, I legitimately thought that this was CGI instead of an actual costume, but lo and behold, it was just an insane costume. Glowing eyes and seemingly actually aluminum parts, and a chest that opens up that you can push it out with your other hand, which is honestly actually a, a decent scare. Frankly, in the video, I was kind of taken aback when they did that, so in real life, I'm sure that it was results in at least a bit of a jump scare, but this kind of thing always impresses the hell out of me, because like the closest I've come to making a full costume was when I helped someone work on one of theirs. But that's the closest I've gotten. Hey, I made like a lightning bolt for the chest, and I, I, I helped, I made paper cup, like bracers, that's about it. This is hella impressive to me. I don't understand how people do this.